You're listening to the Kennel Confidential Podcast brought to you by the United Tree and Feist Association. I'm your host, Davin Ramage. I'm your co-host, Chad Wagner. Let's get into the episode. All right, here we go, Chad. Another episode of Kennel Confidential Podcast, one that I think I can at least say that I've been looking forward to. I'm sure you have too, Chad. We have got Mr. Ed Bates with us, and we're going to talk a little bit about Cadillac Jack. Chad, Mr. Bates, are y'all there? Oh, uh, I am. I'm here. Okay. I think there'll be a lot of people that look forward to listening to this one. Yeah, I'm pretty okay. excited. And it's good to know that this is the first time you've talked about Cadillac Jack on an interview, Mr. Bates. That makes me feel um, good. Absolutely. I've done some podcasts on coon hounds, uh, but never on Jack or the squirrel dog. And I, and I do appreciate you guys, uh, you gentlemen, give me that opportunity. Oh, yeah. There's going to be plenty of people excited about this one, I think. Right. Well, before we jump into that, um, we always like to give the guests an opportunity to kind of tell us who they are, where they come from, what they're doing, um, you know, things other than following dogs. Any other hobbies, fishing, farming, napping, golfing? Uh, I like to nap awful well. (laughs) But I'm a coon hunter and uh, have been all my life. I've always been around dogs from the time I was just a baby. Uh, Dad used to carry me on his back. We'd squirrel up, and uh, and we'd coon hunt. My first love in this world is a tree dog. I mean, there's, I've had beagle hounds, I've had bird dogs, and I enjoyed them all. But I love a tree dog first and foremost. And it doesn't matter if it's a squirrel or a coon. You know, I, I enjoy hearing a, a good dog sitting there in a tree. I'll tell you how I ran, ran into Jack. Jack, uh, I had bought well, I was trying to buy a squirrel dog. A friend of mine, Joe Tackett, called me. And uh, he said, uh, you know, know any place uh, where there's any squirrels? And I said, I don't know if it or not. I probably do. And he said, I've got a, a, a good little squirrel dog. And I said, I bet it ain't worth a flip. Uh, bring it and come, come on over here. So we went, and he had a dog that was uh, half feist and half spits, a uh, little old woolly-looking thing. I think it treated uh, 16 times that day, and we saw 17 squirrels and one double. And man, I'm telling you, it made my heart race. And I said, well, I'm going to buy, well, I tried to buy that dog. I said, what, what did you give for that dog, Joe? He said, I give $250 for him. And I said, my friend, uh, I love you, but you're crazy if you give $250 for that dog. <laughs> but I'm going to show you that I'm crazier than you are. I'm going to give you a 1000 <laughs> And he, <laughs> he said, no, no, you're not. And I said, well, I'm going to buy me a squirrel dog. You know, I went to calling guys and trying dogs. and uh, I didn't see anything, nothing. So I'm sitting here one day, and uh, Larry Maynard, Greg Maynard's dad, called me, and he said, uh, I heard you looking for a squirrel dog. I said, yes, sir. He said, I've got a young dog down here. He said, he don't know a whole lot, Ed. Uh, he'll just treat what he sees. And uh, that was my Mr. Twister dog that I campaigned there for a good while. So he priced him to me, and I said, I'll take him. He said, no, not without trying him, you won't. So he, he brought him up here, and I, I kept him for about a week, and and uh, I think I bought him the second day I had him out. But anyway, I, I kept hunting him. Uh, I ran a lumber company, and I'd go over uh, in the morning, get everything lined out. I'd take off at noon, and I hunted twisters through the uh, foliage and the, and the leaves, you know, right in the heat of the summer every day. I told Joe, I finally, I said, I, I believe I've got a pretty good dog. I, I, I don't really know how they're supposed to act, but that rascal tree squirrels. I said, let's go down to Kentucky. They've got a big hunt down there, and I'll see what I've got. So we went down, and Joe said, you know the rules? I said, no, I'll get I'll get the scorecard read up on before I go. And I did, did that. We went out there, and I can't even honestly remember if it was Kentucky State Hunt or what it was. But anyway, I got down to the final cast, and it was a three-dog cast, and old Jack was in it. Glenn Wright was hunting uh, Jack. I wound up winning that cast. And when we come off the hill, I mean, I, I liked that jack dog. I liked him from the first time I seen him. I told Joe, I said, right there is a diamond in the rough. That dog just needs a little bit of work put put on him with him. And, and I believe that's the ticket. So anyway, I told Glenn, I said, well, Glenn, I, uh, I won the cast, but uh, you're packing the house as far as I'm concerned. I said, would you sell that dog? And he said, yeah. I said, what do you take for him? He said, I'll take $5,000 for him. What year was this? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> so I said, well, like, you're a little over my head. 
So we came home, and Joe's dog died. Joe Tackett's the first squirrel dog that up here that I, I came out of Kentucky. But the first uh, squirrel dog up here I hunted with, that little Spitz and Fife's car, that dog died. And I told him, I said, I'll tell you what you do. You, you call Glenn, tell him your dog died, and ask him what he would take for Jack. And I said, I'll give uh, 3500 for him. Well, Joe, ca- Joe called him, and I think Glenn may have priced him three or 35 or something. But Joe said, now, Glenn, he said, uh, that's a lot of money. He said, I'll tell you what I'm willing to do. I'll give you 2500 for it. And Glenn said, well, I hate to let him go, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you have him. So when we went down there, of course, Joe, he paid Glenn, and Glenn signed the papers. I asked Glenn a few questions. I said, now, Glenn, I, I've hunted with that dog a couple of times. There are two things that I don't like, and I'm going to ask you, you've already sold him. I think, yeah, he, he bought him off of uh, Ernie Blevins, and uh, he was running loose. I think Ernie told me he was about 10 months old and was treated back in the hollow when he bought him. But uh, I said, there's two things about that dog I don't like. That dog would come up missing in action uh, for 30 or 45 minutes about ever hunted that I've seen him in. Because mm-hmm. I, I had Joe go with go in to spectate. And uh, I said, then he'd show back up on the scene and, and treat the heck out of them squirrels. I, I said, what, what's he doing? Is he running the deer or what's going on? And he said, no, he won't run the deer. I've had him over at deer pen. He said, I, I, I don't know what he's doing. And I said, well, the second thing, I said, that dog go down and thump around on trees before he settles and maybe not settle. And Glenn said, well, if you're going in there when he's doing that, if you look around, you'll, you'll find the squirrel. And I said, well, you know, I'm not going to go in there and find him for him. Uh, I'll work on that. And he told me, he said, don't, evidently he'd had a, a shocker on him probably when he took him to that deer pit. But he said, don't put no tracking collar on him. He won't hunt. So I brought him back to here in the kennel and I put a tracking collar on him and let him wear it for about a week. And I uh, took him over here. There's state ground right next to me. And I took him over there. Boy, he popped a squirrel man instantly. I said, all right. <laughs> so I, I shot that thing out and then he come up missing in action. And that's back in the days of the old beep beep, uh, <laughs> collar, collar and antenna. Uh, and I just kept, I just kept cranking it down and cranking it down. Like, and I found him. He was laying in a groundhog hole digging, not saying a word. And I, and Glenn had told me, he said, well, don't never whip him because he can't take a whipping. And I stood there and thought about it. And I thought, well, I either break him because, uh, I ain't got nothing right now, you know, him doing that. And I cut me a big long pole. And, uh, and he and I had a, had a good long talk. <laughs> uh, he tried to back out, and I went and I drove him back in. And that whole, and that was the end of that. He never, he never ever come up missing in action, never treated him or barked, not barked, but dug in the ground after that. And then what I did with him, uh, he was a winding type dog. He, he'd, he'd trim beside, he'd trim off on a track, and a, and a wind tree in son of a gun. And what he was doing when he was thumping, he could smell it in there, but didn't know which tree it was on. And I, I let him thump a little bit, and, and if he didn't settle, you know, I'd, I'd move him out of there. I'd, I'd scream him out, you know, get on out of there if you can't find it. And he quit that. I mean, he just he just polished into one of the finest dogs that, that I ever hunted with. I loved that dog. And I, and I had no idea uh, what a reproducer that sucker was going to be. I bought uh, two dogs in my life for their ability, and both of them turned out to be a supreme reproducer. Jack was one, and the other one couldn't have a hard time spec. I campaigned uh, uh, Jack, and I ran him all over, uh, running PKC hunts. In fact, he was the first dog in PKC uh, to ever score 1,000 points. It tickled me. I, I drew out with a guy, and I can't tell you his name. He said, you want to ride me? And I said, yeah. And I had several spectators. Uh, so I rode with him. Well, I saw a black dog in there. I said, when I got in, I said, is that a five-star deer hunt? He said, goodness gracious, no. He said, you couldn't give me a five-star dog. And I said, is that right? And he said, oh, them things, they'll tree uh, anything that climbs. They'll run hummingbirds or butterflies. I said, <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't doubt that. And we went out there, and buddy, I mean, Jack put on a show. We he made 10 trees, had 10 squirrels, and uh, nobody else had a tree. All right. He, yeah, he had big wheels under him, and uh, and he got treated. He 
he stayed treat. I mean, you know, he wasn't going to move. He wasn't going to pull. Or uh, when he barked up, he wasn't going to drop back down and start trying to find another one, you know. Right. Had good eyes on him. A setback tree dog, which I like. He'd set back about 10 foot. He'd watch that squirrel. that couldn't get away from him. But I did him just like I did Twister when I bought him. Uh, I hunt him a half a day every day, right through the heat and the leaves. Yeah, he, he made one fine animal. I kept on Jack, of course, until he died. We had several good uh, pups out of him. I had I had the Jack Jack two dog old putt putt, and he'd been jockeying around dog traders that had him. I put a lot of work into him, and he he was a gem also. And then we had the had the rock dog, uh, had the, the Jack attack. And Jack attack was out of old Jack and uh, two time world champion Nellie Gray female that I had. He he was like Jack. He 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 covered some dirt. I mean he'd gather up a lot of real estate in the two hour cast. Yeah, I had I've had good luck with him. I'm eighty years old now and I've been blessed. I've I've had good health, I haven't been in the hospital, don't take very many pills. You know, I can still walk flat land. Yeah. Uh, the hills take it out of me. I can't cut the hills no more. I still go and I still love it. Well, I kinda wish you'd have stayed into into them feist dogs. Like he's talking about Jack Attack and, and a lot of those dogs, I've heard a lot about them. And SS yes, Super Sport, which I, I I believe was out of Jack. And he was out of Jack, yes. You know the, which I know the the Jack and oh Mustang Sally Cross done really well. Absolutely, yeah. I've got some of that making some of my dogs now. But you know, a couple of things that you said was interesting is I I guess one is you like a dog to to stand off the tree. You know, that's kindly getting kind of the opposite of what people want these days, but that's yeah. actually what a feist does. I, I want one that's uh, stand back and keeps his eye on that squirrel. If it timbers, I expect that dog to timber. And i tell you something else old Jack would do on a we, – we've got a, a few, not many, of what we call down in Kentucky, pineys and little red squirrels. I'm sure you're familiar with them. They are wilder than a goat. And I've seen him – Seen him timber them dogs, and he'd and he'd shifted into overdrive, run out in front of them, get ahead of them, and and bark in front of them to slow them down or stop them. You know, I haven't seen many dogs do that. The uh, Jack Two dog, he 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 done that old pup bud, but Jack he'd cut if I get timbered a long distance, he'd cut in front of them and stop them. Yeah, that's pretty wild. That's that's that'd be interesting to watch. I hauled him to Mississippi and Michigan. Just had a, a pleasure running that dog and backtracking myself a, a, a bit on that PKC hunt with that guy that had the uh, that cur dog, that black cur dog. I had some spec, no, not many spectators. I probably had eight or ten. But uh, he said uh, we was going to that last tree down there to Jack, and I'd cut him loose with three minutes left in the hunt, and I had nine hundred. The judge said, uh, "You want to just leave him the last three minutes?" I said, "No, I won't cut him." And we were counting out the fence rows. And he said, you only got three minutes left. I said, yeah, that's all right. I like cutting. I might have cut him loose. And he shot down that fence road just as far as he could go, across the gravel road. And soon as he hit that woods down there, he, he dropped on a tree. Of course, we went down and we saw that squirrel. But I heard that guy, one of the spectators, talking to that uh, gentleman I had drawn. I heard him say, every way it can be done. And I asked I asked that guy later, when we was coming back in the truck, I said, what did that guy asked you? He said, uh, he asked me, how in this world is that dog finding all them squirrels and treeing all those squirrels? <laughs> and he said, every way it can be done. He said, by sight, sound, wind, you know, you just eat the total package, buddy. We come back to the clubhouse and they were taking pictures. And I stand there waiting for him to take Jack's pictures in, in the clubhouse. And I turn and I looked and he was sitting up in that guy's lap uh, that I'd hunt against. And I said, Jack, get out from there. And he said, no, 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 leave him alone. He said, he can set my lap anytime he wants. And he was petting on him. And he said, if you ever breed that dog yet, I want a pup. I want to buy a pup. I said, I thought you didn't like Feist. He said, I just thought I did. <laughs> He's been converted. <laughs> We've got a few guys down here that, that I think are about the same way. We're, we're trying to convert them and, and we're, we're getting them one at a time. Right. You ever heard of Leroy Gamble? Oh yeah, I know Libra well. I'm I'm trying to convert him real hard, but he's just fighting us too much, and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll eventually get him. <laughs> uh, he's he's an old cat like me. He likes a tree dog, and he likes, and I'm sure when he goes, he likes to see the game. 
Oh yeah, yeah. I, I love hunting with him. We we had a ball out of him this weekend. We had a hunt down here, and he was here boat and hunted. So, so what about Jack? What uh, I, I know winding ability and, and and all that. I guess he was just a pretty well, pretty flashy dog. It sounds like yeah, he was had a good mouth on him. Now the uh, rock dog I had, he he had a gosh, he had a thundering mouth. Jack didn't have that, but he had plenty good enough mouth. I think the reason Glenn let him go, number one, he didn't give a lot for him. Number two, that dog probably hunted too hard down there in the hills for him. I mean, he when you turn him loose, you you know, he'd be tree squirrels all around you if they were moving. If not, he'd he'd drop on in there. He'd find you a squirrel. Well, that's kind of what I'd heard uh, I guess a couple of people that, that had hunted with Jack and said that he was probably a lot better competition dog than he was a pleasure dog because he would uh, get out there sometimes and you know where Glenn lives it's straight up and down I know it is I know it is and yeah. you get a dog that goes 100 yards you might walk 500 to get that's to right. it that's right to get up there yeah he'd wear you out down there in the mountains there's no question about it but if, if the squirrels were stirring like I say you'd trim them all around you but if they won you could just uh, pull your boots up you get ready to take a hike <laughs> and I like I like that yeah now, well, what were some of the better crosses that you made with him? You know, what breed of, or what line of dogs would you think? I'm going to be honest with you. He crossed pretty darn well with about everything that was brought here to him. You know, uh, Pearly Combs, he bred that old China female. He bred her to him, and, and he got some top dogs out of that. Of course, Tango and and, uh, and Mustang and Sally and Ellie Gray that I had here, like, they all produced good dogs under, uh, under him. But he was... Uh, pretty strong reproducer i mean i don't, I don't think we hardly really did anything you know some some of the crosses were stronger and better dogs you know but about everything that we bred to him shoot dead tree dead tree squirrels now, how big a dog was jack i'm gonna say that jack uh tops of stills at 30 pounds he was he was a pretty good size dog yeah big thick chested dog you could hunt him all day long he'd be just as strong come come dark as he was at daylight you know he he had the energy and the power well i never knew what size dog jack was i've noticed that uh a lot of the dogs i guess that go back to jack or doubled up or you know that been right. lined they they're they're starting to get a little bit big sometimes yeah. and some of them get a little oversized so i didn't know you know on that yeah i think uh when i had him uh take him to hunt say they, they they weighed him, you know, 28, 29, almost 30 pounds. He's right at 30 pounds is what he was. There's a lot of people down there uh, played part in Jack's life. Ernie Blevins had a look, I mean, female named Rusty uh, was his mother. She was out of some of the way, Baldwin Stock and uh, uh, Jeff Pennington and uh, just a lot of the local guys. But the man that, that I sure admired, he lived back, his name was Ken Carroll. And I asked Ken, he said, uh, well, I talked to him uh, over the phone, and he said, you know, if I get the money, Ed, I'd like to breed the Jack. I said, I said, uh, Ken, you don't need no money to breed the Jack. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, he had a dog named Carol's Jack, and, and it was my understanding uh, he was Jack's grandfather. But I asked, I asked old Ken, and Ken, Ken bred them dogs, but he, he really wasn't a breeder per se. He bred to what he had. If you can understand that. But I asked him, I said, what did you start out with? And he said, 36 years ago, a little female came here. And he said she was a small Doberman Pinscher. And I said, a Doberman Pinscher? And he said, yeah. Well, I talked to a couple other guys that lived around there that was friends of his. And they said, that wasn't no Doberman Pinscher. He's talked that for 30-some years. He said, that was a uh, uh, Manchester Terrier. I remember Manchester. this story. It was a Manchester yeah, that's exactly what it was. But then he just bred what he had around there. And I'm sure he did a lot of line breeding, maybe some inbreeding. But uh, he, he'd start them dogs back there in the hollow, and guys would go in there and buy them cheap. You know, and he'd move them on down the road. Yeah, he he deserves a lot of credit for putting Jack together. And he passed away here a few, I'll say a few years, probably 10 years ago. But uh, we went down to his, his funeral. I just respect him. I was the old man. Yes, sir. You know, that's one thing we talked about on our last podcast. 
back then, you know, just like him, he bred to what he had. That's right. And line bred because it was kind of necessity. Absolutely. And it might not be very popular me saying this, but I think getting away from some of that line breeding, I think a lot of the dogs out there, they're, they're, there's not as many good dogs as there used to be, I guess. There's there's probably more exceptional dogs, but I'm just saying overall. Overall, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, and and I think the uh, a big part of that was people breeding to the next big big thing now, because you know if you look back on a lot of the Cadillac Jack breedings that you did, it was still all family line breeding. Most of it was absolutely yes, sir. You know, and I bred that dog uh, quite a bit. I didn't advertise him, but just took on his name. And, you know, I had guys, I've had guys drive from Texas, Florida, to breed to him. You know, I never run no ads, but he just he spoke well for himself. Well, and you may have told us already, how old of a dog was Jack when you bought him? Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to say he was probably, I'm just guessing, maybe three and a half years old okay. when I got him. Yeah. How many years did you... Uh, campaign him in competition, do you think? Uh, two years. Okay. Yeah, I ran two years till you know, till his uh, sons got big enough to start hitting us. Okay. So you had him all yeah. championed out and, and titled out, grand championed out in, in yeah. two years' time. Okay. Oh, yeah. He, he was a five world champion. And he, he was uh, not grand squirrel. The one but super grand. He was super grand squirrel dog. Yeah. And that was all time. I mean, dogs were all drawn out together then? Or were those fox only hunts? Nobody. I hunted him against hounds, hounds and curs. I was down here to had a hunt with him and, and uh, won the first round with him. And I drove out with two two big name cur dogs. I think they were highly highly advertised and promoted. And I heard some guy talking in the corner. And he said, uh, "Them them cur dogs, you know, Jackie will three squirrels, but now them squirrels aren't going to be moving this afternoon. Them cur dogs, one of them will win that." And we went out there and, and uh, we treated three squirrels. Uh, lay up squirrels. Jack treated every one of them. <laughs> I was going to say, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I've met a ton of good people and uh, made friends with uh, with a bunch of guys that I never would never have known had it not been for a dog. You know, what I want or haven't won anymore is all immaterial to me. But I, I value the friendship of the people that, that I was able to accumulate along the way. In fact, I sent my uh, last male dog uh, down to my buddy Mike Williams down in Tennessee. Mike came up here in I don't know the seventies, late seventies, to read the uh, hard time spec. And I told him, I said, "You just never did go away." <laughs> <laughs> they're they're family. Sounds like you was too good to him. I, I fed him too good. <laughs> <laughs> That'll keep most people around. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I, I'm seeing uh, you know the PKC hunts. That I ran in, you know, like I say, I, I ran with whatever was there. And, How many dogs were in those hunts back then? They, they were pretty, pretty good sized hunts. They were, they were money hunts, and I can't even tell you now what the entry fee was. But uh, I won the, with the, the Jack Two Dog, uh, Silver Cup, Cup Classic with him twice, and he was Super Grand Squirrel Champion. You know, I just I hung Jack up. I'd say I didn't run no, no two years. I probably ran about a year and a half. Something like that. What caused you to slow down with him? Just because you had pups coming out of him? But had them young dogs, yeah. yeah. Had him had him titled out and time to campaign something else? That's right. He'd had his turn. So I just kept him here and, and bred him. We bred him to a couple of hounds. I bred a Grand Night Champion Walker Coonhound, some guy brought in here. How did that uh, turn out? Said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, never, I never did know. He said, he, he'll never get her bred. I said, oh, yeah. And I got a ba- I got a bale of straw out of the barn, sit out there, and crop, <laughs> popped right up on it, and got her bread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had to give him a little help. <laughs> but now, now the big money hunts uh, that they're running with the squirrel dogs, uh, it's a total different game. They uh, they got most of them a half hound, half cur, or half bird dog or something, and they of course they won't honor each other at all. They they don't don't score on a whole lot of coon or a whole lot of squirrels because they'll be split treed and, and they might they might drop in there a half a mile you know instantly in tree and one here and one there and one over there you know that game has changed you know that's 
that's not for the average squirrel hunter, for sure. Well, do you think back when you were campaigning, Jack, do you think most people just brought their squirrel dog and, and looking for the best squirrel dog, or, or do you think it was actually getting the dog ready for competition? What, what You know, what's your opinion on that? Uh, the truth is, I think uh, 99% of them just picked up their, their pleasure squirrel dog and went. I, I never did see a lot of difference between the pleasure squirrel dog and the competition squirrel dog for the type that I hunted. You know, like, like I say, it depends where a guy lives. If, if he lives in the mountains, you know, he'd want that dog to stay two or three hundred yards uh, in tight. But, you know, where I live, a dog can hunt. I can go 20 miles north of me and it's flat as your hand or I can go 20 miles to the south and, and you're in the hill country, the badlands. <laughs> the badlands. The bad land. <laughs> Getting pretty close to West Virginia, you go south, aren't you? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. West Virginia and Kentucky. Yeah. I hunted a hunt in West Virginia one time, my junior dog, and we got in there to him and scored him. I was, I had him on a leash and, and climbing boulders on the way up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was rough. <laughs> you get out of the truck, you either get down on your knees crawling up or get on your hind end sliding down. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> and I called you here a few years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but. You know, I was picking your brain about dog. That's when you was telling me the Manchester Terrier story. Right, right. You know, I guess I guess these flies, you know, you see accounts of them, and I think Washington and Lincoln, uh, that they had wrote about a feist dog. And maybe there's still some of that blood that was from there in these, but, but really a lot of these dogs were developed from a terrier-type dog for the most part. I think. Absolutely. They're they're just punched up uh, stock of dogs. They're mixed. I've heard people talk about the Indians bred them out there in the teepee and kept them pure. You know, uh, <laughs> that they might might have been a no Indian done that, but mo- most of them are they're like they're they're like the, the curs. When I was a kid down in Kentucky, you know, we 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 hunted cur dogs and pice dogs and hounds or anything, but most of the uh, cur dogs were hound and, and bulldog or or bulldog and shepherd or something crossed, you know. And mm-hmm. like you said, the feist dogs and smaller dogs just punched up terriers of different types. Well, now now we're trying to, and I, I know you all did back in the day, I guess MTFO was, was out then, and uh, of course NKC. and Right. Uh, they were trying to develop the feist into, uh, I guess, a consistent breed then too. Right. We're still plugging away at that. Well, there's there's enough good feist dog in different lines out there today that that could easily be done. You know, back uh, in the eighties or nineties, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of different lines of dogs out there. You know, that were strong. Yeah, if you don't mind, I know we've been talking a lot about about Jack, but I, I guess maybe try to get some wisdom from you too. And I, I was going to ask you about uh, the spec dog. Yes, sir. Now he made grand night champion twice is that right yeah yeah see yeah. when you when you transfer them they strip your titles they, they take yeah. your titles away from you now uh, they transfer transferred from owners or no no uh see back in the early 40s i think 43 to be exact no it wasn't 43 it was 45 they pulled a walker breed uh because there's guys that like that particular color dogs you know that open spotted dog and, and want to do with the ticks, they pulled them out of the English breed. And then in 46, they pulled the, the American, what's known today as American Blue Tick. Uh, the Walker Dogs and the American Blue Ticks, at one time, their forefathers were registered English dogs. They, they crossed uh, the Walkers that they pulled out to establish that color. They, they, they uh, crossed them on the running stock dogs that were tree dogs to establish their color. You know, the blue ticks were a little heavier headed, uh, more of a cold trailing type dog. But uh, you know, they all go they all run back to the same same line of dogs, you know. And to be honest, uh well I'm getting we're gonna get off off the subject here, but anyway, when they allowed them to do that, to pull them dogs out, they had an agreement that anyone that had a, a walker or a blue tick and wanted to transfer it back uh to the English breed they could. And see so Speck was born a walker dog. My buddy Calvin, uh, he bought him off of Russell Wagers out of Glasgow, Kentucky. 
Well, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you a quick story about, yeah, if you want to talk about him. I was at the World Hunt, uh, a local guy here, uh, Scratch Waters, good handler, always carried a good hound. Him and Joe House grew out together. And I seen this guy that that was running this other dog. I didn't know him. That other dog was back. But they came back in, and I asked Scratch Waters, I said, uh, you bust him, buddy? He said, good Lord, no. He said, man, we got busted. I'll tell you that. And I said, what happened? He said, there's a little walker dog all ticked up, about half starved to death. He said, while we was beating and banging around in them cornfields, he said, that dude was popping them out to the sidelines in the fence rows and nailing them. And he said, oh, no, he beat us to death. So I went over and checked on it. And that guy's name was Houston Carter, is what he had on the, uh, uh, on the board. And he was high dog that night and high dog the next night. So I went out there and I talked with that guy and I thought it was Houston Carter. He was a handler and he was in an, uh, in an old junkie truck and had, and had spec tied up in the back. So I talked there with him a while. Well, he had, uh, two cast wins. I mean, he was sitting big boy in the world. Hunt. They called out that night and he no showed. He, he never showed up to the line. And I went out there, and there that guy was in the front seat of that uh, truck. Uh, I tried to wake him up so he was passed out or something. I told Russell Wagers, I told Russell and Calvin, I said, you know, I was still in the talk pointing going on. I said, uh, as soon as this hunts over, I, I'm going to get a hold of that Carter guy. And I, I, I said, I'll, I'll get his address, and, and I'll, I'll surely know someone lives around there. Russell Wagers came home, and and he got a hold of uh, Houston Carter's mother. And he said, uh, I run into Houston up to that hunt. And, and she said, uh, you never run into Houston. He's in prison. Russell said, well, who was hunting that dog? Speck. She said, I don't know. And uh, so Russell, he called over to prison. And he talked with Houston. And he bought him over the phone. And, <laughs> and Houston told him where he was at and uh, where the papers were at. He said, take the money and give it to my mother. So he... At that time, Russell had uh, a stylish slipper. He owned stylish slipper, and he had his back. Well, Calvin had a Grand Night Champion female, and he called Calvin trying to buy that female. And in some way, they traded. Calvin got spec, and, and he got the female off of Calvin because uh, he wanted to breed to the stylish slipper dog he had. Mm-hmm. Well, Calvin hunted him. I hunted a lot with him. I liked him, man. So we were at a, at a world hunt to... Uh, See, Calvin bought him in 76, and uh, he won Walker Days with him. And that, they had the, what they called an English World Championship. He won that with him. We were up to hunting. He, he had two dogs up there, Speck and, and a good Walker dog, male dog he had. And he'd, he'd had a few beers, and he came over to my room, and he said, Buddy, I'm quitting. He said, I swear I come up with your two good dogs there is on the ground and can't win a cast. I've quit. Well, that day, Calvin had saw me sell hop sing to uh, Clarence Bannister and down there in Georgia for 4500 And uh, I said, what do you take for, for the spec dog, Cal? And he said, 4500 <laughs> I said, well, here, here it is, old buddy. <laughs> Bring him over here. <laughs> but he'd come back over, the next, over to my room the next day and sat down. And he said, you know, I was about half drunk when I sold you that dog. I said, I know that, Cal. And I said, uh, you know, I understand that. And if you want him back, uh, that's no problem. He said, no. No, no. He said, Ed, I wanted you to have that dog because I know you could do something with him and I, and I can't. He said, I want, I wanted you to have that dog. And I said, well, I sure appreciate it. But he just took off. He, I mean, that sucker, he was a reproducer nurse. Uh, it was 79. I won the world hunt with him. He died in 83 or 84. But goodness gracious, he put some dogs on the ground and they're still strong today. With the same characteristics, pretty much at old spec had. Just a well, strong strong line of dog, man. I, I guess, not to hijack it again, but I, I guess I, I've got a question just for for me personally, I guess, because we're kind of going through it with the feist dogs now. Right. You, know, you were talking about the, the splitting of the, the English to the to the walkers and then onto the blue tick. Right. You know, how much how much I, I guess, for lack of a better word, how much controversy was there that blowed up over that? A bunch. They 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 had a they had a big spill out, out of that. But the truth was, there wasn't all that many of them dogs that really got jerked out of the breed. You know, the English. What they we're going through with the feist dogs is kindly normal. It sounds like. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
absolutely. You know, people don't like change. I don't care if it's for, for the better, but they still don't like change overall. But yeah, we, uh, we, we, we it didn't, it, the English breed didn't suffer much from it. Let me put it that way. You know, they took the walkers and built them up the way they wanted them, the same way as the blue takes. And, and I think I speak for Devin too, but, you know, I, I like to gain knowledge, you know, whether it's about Jack or I've heard bits and pieces of, of hard time spec. Right. And, and then, you know, talking to, wanting to talk to people that's going through the free changes and, and separation, kind of like what we're doing with the Feist dog now. And, right. You know, it, it, it's always good to get knowledge. Absolutely. I'm 80 years old and I learn something every day. You know, people, like I said, they don't want change and they sure don't like competition. A lot of them don't. That's like spec. Uh, Fred Miller from UKC, he stopped transfer spec stopped it. He, he stopped it due to spec and he said uh, well you know so many of the walker guys are, are raising cane well, it wasn't the walker guys because they wasn't going to breed to him no way you know he was a ticked up dog it was english guys that were advertising and promoting stud dogs they, they didn't want, want him in that factory but he he stopped it he stopped uh if i remember right i was president of the english association at that time and uh they were scared. All the officers and directors were afraid that uh, UKC was going to pull our charter, and they they agreed to it. That's fine, though. So I'm out of here. But I, I went back since then. Well, while we're on the uh, coon dogs and English dogs, and we've already mentioned Leroy already, was Speck and uh, Hillbilly Mike in it at the same time? Did, did you ever draw out against each other? No, I never did draw it. I think my son did, but not with Speck. But that, that Mike was a good dog. Well, I was just kind of curious for, for podcast yeah. bragging rights sake, because we've had Leroy on already, too. So right. bragging that rights sake, one. I want to know who won. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, Devin, we ain't too far. Don't get this feud started too hard. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and just to kind of circle it back around to Jack, I know, I mean, clearly, obviously, Jack's, we <clears throat> you lost him a while back. But how, how what ripe age did Jack live to? How old was he? I think he died when he was nine, if I remember right. He was nine years old. And normally, a feisty dog, you know, the smaller dogs, they'll live. Some of them 15, 16 years old. But, uh, you know, he'd been he'd been hunted hard, and he'd been bred quite a bit. He's he, wore out. <laughs> he, he liked me. He just wore out, you know. <laughs> do you do you still have any feisty dogs at your house? Do you have any of his blood at all? I've got two that are six months old, and both both of them, I heard them treat down here with it. And when they were three and a half months old, they was down behind the barn treat and they were laying it on. I don't know what they had treed. I never went down there. It might have been a butterfly or, or a bullfrog <laughs> or something all along. They were telling on it, though. That's right. They were talking the talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do they go back to Jack or are they out of something oh, else? No, they're, they're Jack breath. Cool. Yeah, you know, as, long as, as long as I live and have a a coon dog, it's going to be a speck bread dog. And as long as, as long as I live, if I have a fox dog, it's going to be a jack bread dog. Well, with that level of success, success with both dogs, there's I don't see any reason at all at getting away from it. No, no. We've got uh, uh, two Grand Night Champion Ings dogs, and uh, I don't have many times specs in their pedigree, but they're, they are typical spec dogs today. They're like the dogs that, you know, the, the world champion and a dog that I had that was out of spec. You know, you just, I walk up, number one, I walk up and look at them and tell you if, if they're spec, you know, heavy spec red dogs. I can see it. And have and you got a lot of people just around you up there that, that keep the jack blood and the spec blood close to you? Uh, we've got uh, quite a few coon hunters that do. Now, anymore, we don't have that many squirrel hunters around here. Well, I'm, let me rephrase that. There's a few that just pleasure hunt, you know. But we, we don't have any guys that hit the competition uh, anymore. A lot more cur dogs up in your country now than there are feist, I believe. There is, yeah. Now, I guess one question I've always kindly tumbled around in my mind, and maybe maybe you can have some insight on it, because I've always liked to, to go back when I was in Beagles or, or with these feist dogs. I've always kindly tried to go back and, bring that old blood forward if i could right 
Right. Do you, do you think that you miss out on advantages of the crosses that's been made, or, or do you think that – I guess the thing that I always wonder is if, if the old blood can still compete today, I guess is what I'll say. Uh, see, I, I get asked that all the time, and honestly, I don't know. You know, it's a different era, a different time, and a different card. I like what, what I had back then. I love them. I think uh, – I may be telling you wrong, but I think I, I – seven dogs that i owned during two town hall of fame wow uh, congratulations and, on that yeah and i've been blessed to have owned three world champions i mean i received a lifetime achievement award and was inducted into the coon hunters hall, hall of fame but i tell everybody i said all of that's in the past and that 99 cents will buy you a cup of coffee at mcdonald's <laughs> <laughs> the <senior cup. laughs> it doesn't matter you know <laughs> Well, it, it may not matter to the, the person selling you the coffee, but to us dog enthusiasts, it matters a whole lot. We're glad to we're glad to have that blood still circulating. Right. It's just been a good and wonderful ride. Like I said, I've been blessed. I put the time into it. A lot of guys, uh, let's say, oh, Ed's the luckiest guy in the world. Any, any dog he gets turns out to be a good dog. Well, uh, if you could take a guy to hunt six and seven nights a week and works every day, you know put a lot of shoe leather in there there's a, there's a difference between the guy that's, that's fighting to do something and you know the guy that goes once a week or something with a dog yeah if you don't put the time in you definitely can't have a dog but you get yeah. out of it what you put into it and and what you said there's a lot of pressure too uh you know and, and everybody thinks every time that you pull up you're going to have that good dog that's right that's right <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you just don't have a good dog. You just want to show up. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I do it every time I show up. <laughs> what are people going to think if I don't show up with a with a good dog? You know, that's right. <laughs> I, I wouldn't take nothing for my experience with the dogs. You know, like I said, I ran a lumber company, and everybody in the county, but my coon hunting and, 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 and squirrel hunting friends are the people that I'm close to. Because we've got something in common. What is it with squirrel dogs and sawmills? I was thinking the same thing. You know, he's talking about uh, uh, poor Fort Bill this past week, and he got started at a sawmill. So, and then here <laughs> we <right>. are. Yeah. <laughs> We're hunting all the wrong spots, Chad. We got to take our know. young dogs to sawmills. That's right. Yeah, you got to be at the right time or at the right time at the right place. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Timing is everything. <laughs> there, there is a couple sawmills here around where I live. I, I'm gonna go knock on their door and say, "Hey, I got a pup. I'm just gonna leave it here for the day." Yeah, <laughs> I might <can> get it. <laughs> yeah, I'll be back this afternoon. I'm gonna see if the sawmill will rub off on it. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Jack, do you, do you uh, or what? I guess will you admit to or or what was maybe his faults? Did he have any faults or or yeah. certain dog faults? Yeah, uh, yeah. I never had a perfect dog. Uh, I had a guy call me from West Virginia. He said, that, I, "I assume your dog is perfect." And I said, "My goodness, no! I never saw a perfect dog." And he said, "Well, I'm not going to breed my females something that's not perfect." <laughs> I said, "Well." I, I hope you do me a favor. And he said, what's that? And I said, when you find that perfect dog, give me a call. Cause I'd love to go hunt with it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, when, when I got Jack, he had uh, two kinks in his armor and that was that missing an action stuff and thumping around on trees in there, you know, and, and I cleaned that up. He did to suit me. He didn't really didn't have any. He just didn't have any. He wasn't mean. He wouldn't buy a biscuit. Just a good-natured fellow. Just something I really enjoyed hunting. But then again, depends who you are. And you might ask the next guy, and he said, dog hunted too hard. Oh, I don't uh, know. I, I'd like to have a dog that hunted too hard. <laughs> that's what I like. That's what I like. A, a gentleman, I can't tell you his name, came up from West Virginia. I didn't know him. He said, uh, I'll tell you the reason I'm up here. He said, I'd like someone, you know, he'd call me about breeding. He said, my dad told me he said i don't know a thing in the world about that jack dog not one thing but if ed owns him here's two things he will do he will go hunting and he will be a tree dog he said i guarantee you that <laughs> i said well <laughs> who's your dad <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh 
in this area here and probably most areas, uh, our hunting grounds are getting more and more limited. We've got more and more highways. I don't know. I believe, in, a, in a coon hounds, we need to rein them back just a little bit, I think. But, but that, you know, they're, they're made for the today's card. Well, you know, and I was listening to another podcast today, actually, while I was driving, and, and that came up. It was a coon dog interview, but they were talking about, I believe the guy was saying that, you know, with the shrinking amount of blocks of timber because of expansion and everything right. else, um, you know, that they were kind of prophesizing, I guess, that a dog that'll hunt a little closer is maybe becoming more valuable in some areas just because the timber's shrinking so much. And I can see that. Yeah. So, yeah. so they're, so it sounds like they're wanting to back up to what they used to have. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, and and I was actually talking to uh, Melissa Nash. She was down for the hunt this weekend. I went out and spectated a cast with her and a couple other guys. And I, yeah, I was telling them that I just take it for granted. You know, they were coming. She come down from um, Maryland and was just you know talking about how great it was hunting LBL and having the space. And the other guy, uh, John Ellison, was up from Texas, and you know he was going on and on about how great it was. There's another guy with us, um, Travis Watkins. He's a local guy here to West Kentucky, so he's a little used to LBL. But anyway, I was telling them, you know, I guess I probably take it for granted because you have these two people from, you know, that drove eight, nine hours apiece from opposite sides of the country talking right. about, you know, just how good it, the ter- the the hunting was. I don't want to say terrain because we were in the hills when we were talking, the hills of LBL. But, you know, I guess I do take it for granted a little bit just having it here in the backyard. Um, but you listen to some of these other podcasts across, across the country, you know, it it appears that the large blocks of timber are, are shrinking drastically by the year. They sure are. They are. You know, I, I quit coon hunting there for a while for personal reason, and uh, when I, I had all kinds, of, all kinds of places that I could hunt. Well, I get out, start driving around to go, go talk to the landowner, and there's houses sitting in every woods that I went to. You know, it's places where you can't hunt. Mm-hmm. Now we're blessed here. We've got. Uh, four big boundaries of state ground and of course it gets stunt tarred you know but there you can still you can still treat coons you can treat squirrels in there whatever you know it's big enough there you can turn a hunting dog loose yeah yeah my family's got a chunk of land up uh, about an hour and 15 minutes from where i live but i've got my dad lives on the farm up there but i had a buddy of mine ask me the other day they shut lbl down for the quota hunt and they run all those small game guys out of there and i think i was right. complaining about it and a non squirrel hunting buddy of mine, he said, Why don't you go up there to your, your family's place and hunt? And it's about 100, 120, 140 acres. It depends on which family member you're asking. Of that, the the farmer that is leasing it, I think he says he's farming 90 acres. And the, so the timbers broke up in small patches and all over the place. I told them, I said, I spend more time moving from this block of timber to the other one to find an armadillo or a possum that it's not worth driving an hour and 15 minutes up there to hunt it. Now, have you got armadillos down there now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would yeah, say no. probably the past, I've really seen them increase probably the past five years. It may have been more than that, but at least five years ago is when you started noticing them run over on the roads. Uh, right. And right. I had a dog, at, well, up there at my dad's, I actually had a dog two years ago. I had He was young, and I had him out there just trying to get him to tree something. And he was, I don't know, 100 yards from me and just laid in barking good. And I thought, holy smokes, he's done it. You know, I'm on a sprint over there trying to get that squirrel to him. And when I get there, I saw him before I saw the armadillo. And he's he's head down, nowhere near treeing, you know. And he's right. telling that armadillo everything he could think of. Oh, and he didn't like it. <laughs> he didn't, I couldn't get him away from it. He had his head, the armadillo had his head buried in a hole and was showing him his backside. And I right. went and hooked the dog and said, come on, you know, leave it alone, leave it alone. <laughs> And I walked him, I don't know, probably 40, 50 yards, cut him loose. He turned around and went right back to it. I liked to never got him away from that armadillo. Oh, my. Yeah. Then he left out of there and treated a possum. <laughs> never, we never did shoot a squirrel that day. <laughs> as long as he's treeing something, I'd be happy. I was a lot happier about the possum than I was the armadillo. <laughs> we don't have no billers up here yet. Well, I understand they're coming from the south, so I don't know. Maybe yeah. give it a few years, you'll have them. They'll be here. Now, I was. Out. We got a lot of uh, coyotes and, and bobcats are really making a comeback here. Uh, for years we didn't have no cats, but we got plenty of them now. Plenty of bobcats. Back this spring, I went down to my cabin and uh, I got a feeder up down there. 
And I just sat in the truck, uh, had my wind up, and I just sat there in the truck before I went up to cabin to see what was stirring. And I saw a pretty good sized animal coming up to there, and I thought, what the heck is that? You know, I thought, that's somebody's dog. And it came up and it smelled around the feeder. And then I seen it flipping that tail. I said, that's a daggone cat. And it came right up um, within eight foot of my truck and, and stood there. Uh, I didn't even take a picture of it because I'm like probably what you were. I was, I was so amazed looking at that thing. I thought that right there is the ultimate hunter, you know. Mm-hmm. And muscles on that dude, sleek. ears working back and forth. And I, I was impressed with it. That's the first one I saw here in Ohio. What amazed me, we with the coonhounds, we've never got after a cat, as far as I know. That is for me. I think being out at night and stuff, yeah, you think you'd really run into them. Yeah, yeah, but we we, we haven't got after any. Not that I want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mister Bate, we, we try to at least get a a good story out of people on on every episode, and kind of a funny story. Or do you have anything that you'd like to admit to? <laughs> I'll I'll take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you tell us one on Jack? Have you got a uh an off game or, or, uh, just a favorite Jack hunting story. I think the listeners that are, you know, tuning in for Cadillac Jack, you know, they may be interested in hearing at least maybe even your favorite Cadillac Jack hunting story. Probably the, I already told my, my, probably my favorite Jack story was that PKC hunt. I mean, three them 10 squirrels and had all the spectators and did it all by itself. Yeah. That, I enjoyed that more than anything. I took it, uh, let me back up a little bit. I get 2,500 for Jack and after I'd, uh, conditioned that dog I, I took him to mississippi down there at that casino and there was a guy came up to me there was a group of us there and he said who's the man owns the cadillac jack dog and he had on camo camo and i said uh well it depends if he owes you money i don't know where he's at <laughs> but, but if he don't it might be me and he said you own him i said yes sir he said you want to sell him i said no no i want to sell him and he said uh, i'll give you sixty five hundred dollars for him and I said, well, that's a decent offer, but uh, no, I don't want to sell him. And he walked away, and the guy asked me, he said, you know who that guy is? I said, no, i never seen him before. He said, if he, if he wanted Jack, he'd give you twenty-five or 50000 He said, he's the man that owns this casino, that Lady Luck <laughs> Casino. Oh, wow. I said, well, maybe I should have talked to him more, you know. <laughs> <laughs> should have negotiated a little better. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to sell him, but a wealthy man could own him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know and and that's one note that i had here that that i wanted to hit on you with but after talking to you um it turns out my note was wrong you know i had a note about just what it was like to to own that once in a lifetime dog that that leaves his mark on a breed you know uh, which after right. talking to you you've got speck and and seven other hall of famers uh yeah. coon dogs so you've you've had a few lifetime dogs but uh um, yeah been, been fortunate yeah yeah but just you know just reflecting back on all all that's pretty cool um and it's it's always good to get it from the horse's mouth you know the man that hunted them that's right that's right I, i'll tell you about something about speck that dog had been abused horribly he lived a rough life and and i was at a, at a hunt i think i might have been in arkansas and of course speck was raised there in tennessee and there was a gentleman with bibbed overalls walked up a heavy set guy, and, and Speck wasn't very friendly with people. I mean, he wasn't he wouldn't bite you or nothing like that. He just, you know, he'd more of a loner. He didn't care uh, if you pet him or if you didn't. And that guy walked up, and Buddy Speck went wild, trying to jump on that guy just like he was tickled to death. And I said, "That dog acts like he knows you." And he said, "Yeah, he knows me." He said, <clears throat> "Houston had that dog down there in, and he said had him tied up on a short chain." And he'd leave for a week and never, never uh, have anyone take care of him or leave him any feet or water. And he said, I was a postman. And he said, every day when I delivered mail, I'd go back here and feed that dog and water him. Dang. You know, he said, I've fed him many, many, many meals. And I said, well, he sure knows you because I never seen Mac like that. He'd been beat on and thumped and abused, like I said. And when I got that dog, he, uh, I could put on my very best black suit and set him in the cab with me and drove from here to San Diego and I'd never have a hair on me. He'd stay on his side of the seat. You know, he wasn't shy or nothing, but he just 
distance. But I remember uh, the year I won the world hunt with him. I'd won fifth the year before with him. Uh, you know how old, old crazy hunters are. They'll talk to their dogs. And me and him had hunted uh, 66 nights in a row. Whoa. And I, you know, I took him to where I thought was the break point. And then I put him up pretty much on keep. Uh, I put him up, I think, 11 days before I went to the world hunt. But anyway, I turned around. I said, Speck, buddy, I've done all I can for you, son. You know, it's up to you now. And that dog got up and come over and laid his head on my lap. And I thought, world, look out. Here we come. We're a team. <laughs> he knew what we you are, said. Yeah. <laughs> we are a team now, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think the, the sport in general kind of gets a bad rap. You know, of course, there's, I'm going to call them tree huggers because they're probably not listening. I don't care if they are. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they're, you know, the tree huggers out there that, that think that, you know, us – dog guys are just hard on them and and we're using one animal to to chase another defenseless animal and and you know what i try to tell anybody that ever combats it is is just come do it you know now if if you're a pita tree hugger i got nothing for you but you know if if you're any kind of outdoorsman and enjoy any kind of outdoor sports at all you know just come do it i mean it it'll it'll change your mind in a heartbeat right and i i see something on facebook of course, it's none of my business what people do, but I wish they wouldn't do it. They'll, they'll put a video on there uh, of a dog fighting a coon or, you know, three or four dogs on one coon. I thought, man, that, that's just ammunition for those folks. Right. Yeah. 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 There's people that can understand it, but but those tree hugger types, they just ain't going to understand it. No, no. That or, that or having 50, 60 squirrels piled up on a tailgate, you know. Ab- absolutely. You know, I've always been a firm believer, and I've told several people this. I, I think if you love your dog as much as your dog loves you, you two as a team, you, you'll get more out of that dog than if you don't like it at all. That's what 99% of the guys don't understand. Dogs are a lot smarter, more intelligent than what we give them credit for. I never was a guy for constantly beating on a dog night after night, you know. If I couldn't straighten it up with a few training sessions and somebody else needed it, I didn't need it. Right. But that's like our Dixie female. She's a three-time world champion in English, and this year she was the uh, reserve world champion. And, and she, she'd she been worked on. You know, they'd get her out of the dog box and wear her out, and she'd shoot in there as hard as she could go, as fast as she could go, get on, hit a road and run down a road and all kinds of crazy stuff. But my son Scott, he hunts her, and uh, he loves that dog. That dog loves him, and you can see it. He hunts a lot by himself, and he'll send me a video, and, and you hear him in there talking. You know, where's he at, girl? I know you got him. He, he does a good job just talking to her, and you just <laughs> sit there in that head, you just see it tickles her to death. <laughs> She's a place where somebody's going to respect her and, and treat her right. Yeah, and it'll make all the difference in the dog. Absolutely. I, I believe if, if some if somebody the right person was standing around in the woods and I was talking to my dog sometimes it had me in a straight jacket in the rubber room somewhere. Oh, yeah. they think it's crazy. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, Mr. Sir. Bates, we've kept you on the phone now for an hour and fifteen minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I haven't run out of air yet. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed all of it. I, I do appreciate you folks giving me the opportunity to talk. Yeah, but we do appreciate you coming on. I'm I'm glad that we that we've done it. Like I said, it's always good to get it right from the horse's mouth. And and these these old line of dogs and these um, the success stories from yesteryear. You know, all the years before the internet and podcast and Facebook and all YouTube, where right. you can go on and just find these dogs and do it. You know, this I, I said it last episode too. But this is what we want to get down. This is to me. This is more important than than any hunt that happened last weekend, you know, um, that's right. th- this is a stuff that's it. worth documenting. That's right. Are we still uh, recording? Sure. Yes. Yeah. If you got something okay. you want to say, yeah, I do. Uh, first I want to wish all the guys that, uh, that hunt good luck with their dogs, uh, get out there and enjoy them. That's what the sport's all about. And if you've got a female you want to breed, don't be afraid to cross the line, uh, into another line of dogs. There's a lot of jealousy out there in the dog world, and, and that'll hold a, ba- a man back quicker than anything. You know, get out there and breed the best of the best and hope for the rest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like that. Well, it's definitely been a pleasure 
pleasure of talking to you and um I'm, I'm glad we was able to get together and, and get you on here and I, pre- I do appreciate your insight and and like i said i've asked you a couple of questions of you know kind of what we've got going on in the feist world today and it i guess it gives me more hope to seeing you know where we're at was kind of the same spot that the other breeds were at and we can get move on yeah the future is ours it's ours to have and hold well thanks again i don't know we may do a whole nother uh spec episode one of these days it sounds like there's a lot to talk about there too all right sounds like a winner to me all right all right now